It is a very good morning to you. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Denzel and David, and this is the Breakfast Club. I uh, hope you all doing uh, well in this uh, uh, environment where people are staying indoors. We are staying home by, you know, it's, it's, it's the new normal, like what people are saying, but the new normal has been very difficult to many and is not easy. But also, I think we, we really need to still keep safe, wear a mask, like I always say, and that's what the health uh, officials are actually encouraging us, that we should wear a mask, practice social distancing, and wash our hands frequently. I mean, you can see from the last uh, weeks or so that uh, the, the statistics in terms of people, you know, uh, testing positive are actually going up. Uh, people dying of uh, COVID-19 are actually going up. I think now we have already in the 80s and very soon we'll be in the uh, 90s and uh, uh, soon we'll, the number will be out of control. So we, we're really encouraging people to, to stay at home uh, if you are not uh, doing anything, if you don't have business in town. But also, we, we're coming to you, you know, uh, I think we last had a, a live program last week, and we've seen over the weekend uh, the, the state uh, in action uh, because of the July 31 protests. There was so much violence that was going on. Um, of course, uh, with the news as well last night that um, the, the, the current uh, vice president, uh, Constantine Tuwenga, has been um, appointed the Minister of Health. I know some people were joking about it, some people were laughing, but Congress, this is not a laughing matter. I mean, it's something that is very serious because it is about the lives of the people. It is about the, the state of uh, you know, the, the health delivery system. And I know there were also people who were talking about the legalities of the appointment, that is it legal. Uh, I'm not a, a lawyer. But when I was trying to, to read around the, the issue of the vice president being a minister, I, I, I realized that in 2015, the NCA took uh, a matter to court after President Robert Mugabe had appointed um, Emerson Nangagwa, uh, the minister of justice, or in fact, the, the, the Emerson Nangagwa was the minister of justice when he was appointed vice president. And the, 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 the NCA took the issue to court saying that uh, according to the constitution, the vice president could not be a minister. They, they lost that case because uh, uh, the then uh, vice, uh, I mean, vice chief justice or deputy chief justice, uh, Luke Malaba, they said that uh, uh, Amazon Nangagwa had been sworn in as the, mini, as the vice president and, and not as the minister of health. And therefore the president had the power according to section, if I remember the section uh, of the constitution, he, were, he could, the president could assign a vice president to any, to run any ministry. So the question is, was a, 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 a Tuwenga appointed minister of health or he was assigned uh, to, to, to uh, run the Minister of Health, because if he doesn't take oath as the Minister of Health, I think the, the, these guys will get away with it to say he has been si assigned. But we're, we're talking about a man who has always been in and out of hospital. Uh, so that means he's not always there most of the times. It is not a doctor. And some people will argue that the permanent secretary is a doctor, then IBT was the Minister of Finance. He de doesn't have finance. Uh, Simba Makoni was the Minister um, of, uh, you know, finance and he doesn't have finance and, and all these kind of things. I saw someone even saying that Chamisa was the minister of ICTs and he knows that he's not a technician. So these are the, 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 the problems that we find. But what I can say is, Zenzel, is that uh, the, the health sector is very delicate. We are already talking about infrastructure that has collapsed and uh, I'm not sure whether the, the, the current vice president is the energy, the knowledge and the zeal to turn around. But there are some people who are saying that if they talk about the, the divisions in Zanubia are uh, anything to do, go by, the president is saying, okay, you want to, you think that I'm the one who's failing, I'll give your men who you think can take over the challenge and see what he's going to do. There are some people who are also saying, probably Chiwenga said, you know, I have my Chinese connections, I'll take over the Minister of Health, run it, turn around the issues, and then we see what happens. So these are the, all the, 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 the theories that are flying around. But at the end of the day, it is the ordinary Zimbabweans who, who are going to you know, feel the brand. And of course, we know that the, when the vice president was just acting president, he actually you know, came all full force when the doctors on strike and failed to resolve that issue and is now the minister. You know, so the, 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 the minister is, a, is, a, is an army official or an ex-army official, is a military man. The, 
a permanent secretary is a military man. So we, we are going to run our health ministry the military way, and uh, it doesn't look good for Zimbabwe. Anyway, today in our program, we'll be talking uh, about the state of, um, I mean, the, 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 the issue of violence in the post-colonial Zimbabwe, because we, we have always had you know, the issue of uh, no violence uh, is ever since the colonial state. And we, we want to talk about that. And the person who's going to be helping me discuss this uh, issue is Abraham Sender. He's a PhD candidate a PhD candidate in African history at the University of Minnesota. Currently, he's um, doing a research to investigate how boxing and ideas of sportsmanship were weaponized in an attempt to create a submissive colonial subject in the Southern Rhodesia. Uh, comrade, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, you know, your, 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 your current research sounds interesting. You know, talking about boxing and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the use of boxing as a weapon. What is it all about? Um, so I think it's actually very appropriate that you are talking about violence and you're starting with boxing. Um, so if you look at boxing, it's one of the most violent sports. And in the colonial period, particularly with British colonialism, uh, the British colonial state was very interested in creating submissive colonial subjects, uh, colonial citizens who would not challenge the state. And through the use of sports such as cricket, swimming, and other sports, and the prominence of ideas such as of sportsmanship, the state wanted to create ideal colonial subjects, subjects that could be told how to behave appropriately, right? But when you look at a sport such as boxing, it's such a violent and combative sport, and it doesn't lend itself well to the creation of an ideal colonial subject because violence is very central to its practice. And unlike other colonial sports, uh, such as cricket or, uh, or, po or polo, boxing was not exactly a foreign sport to Africans. Historically, and pre in pre-colonial Africa, there were many sports in pre-colonial Africa that were very similar to boxing. And in that sense, boxing was not very ideal to the kind of values that the British wanted to, uh, to impart to African subjects. So you see that most of the early nationalist and political organization in colonial Southern Africa, um, uh, colonial Zimbabwe, then Southern Rhodesia, actually started with boxing. Africans were using boxing as a cover to organize politically. They were using boxing to sell alcohol. Uh, a lot of African women in Bari, which was uh, Harare at the time, made a lot of money and bought a lot of houses using uh, money that they had acquired from selling Banje, marijuana, and Mangoromera to African boxers. So boxing occupies a very central place in the colonial history of Zimbabwe. And it, it is located between the tensions between the colonial state and Africans. Because for Africans, boxing becomes the outlet to organize politically. It becomes the outlet to consume alcohol, which they are not allowed to do by the colonial state. So yeah, I, I remember reading about Stand Square in Makokoba. You know, it was the center for boxing, and a lot of yeah, people yeah, went yeah. to Makokoba uh, to mm. play boxing. And it becomes the center as well of the liberation struggle, where people are doing political meetings in Makokoba, you know, and, and all those kind. Of, and you find that within those boxing matches, you you end up having even tribalism. You know, people are being set yeah. uh, up. You know, Shona versus Ndebele, and, and and all those kind of things. So, but also out of it, they then end up, you know, forming a national. Uh, uh, groups and, and, and they become nationalists and Makokoba becomes the center uh, for nationalism. But looking at the, I mean, our topic today, we're talking about you know, violence in the, in, in, in the post-colonial state Zimbabwe. And the, there's a guy who wrote a book, uh, his name is Ivan uh, J.K. Spanda, you know, Spona. He, he says um, he has a book called A State Born Out of Violence. And he, in his book, he talks about how the liberation struggle was violent itself. You know, the Pungwes, you know, we are the fish, you are the water. If you are accused of being a sellout, you are killed. You know, yeah. and the, that culture then comes into the, the, the newfound state. So Zimbabwe is a, a country that is born of, you know, you're, you're beaten up to submission. What's your view on that? Um, so I think the issue of violence and the liberation struggle is very interesting. And I'll start a little bit much earlier than that. Um, so people like Franz Fanon actually argued that violence was very necessary for the decolonization process. And I think it was also, he also argues that it was necessary to reestablish uh, and reassert the humanity of the colonized. 
But if you look at the kind of narratives that emerge out of, out of the liberation struggle, they sort of downplay the violence of the state or the violence of the liberators upon the populace. The only narrative that we get is that the liberation fighters were, had a very symbiotic relationship with the community. They got food and they protected the community. But there are many stories of people that were victimized by Anamkoma or the Mjibas during the liberation struggle. Uh, people were killed, uh, people were assassinated, or sometimes were based on very dubious evidence. So this violence, I think, is very central to, her, to, the, ex to the very execution of the liberation struggle. And I think those tendencies, they have a way in which they persist even into the post-colonial period. And I think I would agree with your earlier assertion that this is a country or a state born out of violence because violence is very central to its practice. And this is a violence that is state sponsored. Only the state has this kind of monopoly over this kind of violence. And you don't see any other, um, you don't see the state being challenged with that violence. Of course, there are protests here and there, but for the most part, it is the state that is violating people. And I think the violence that you see in the post-colonial period is even more dangerous because this is the violence of the liberators, right? These are people that are supposedly going to liberate us from the violence of colonialism. But when you look back now, it's very hard to draw differences between the kind of violence that you see on Africans by the colonial state and the kind of violence that you see from the post-colonial state. Yeah, I mean, we, we are talking about violence and, and we, in the past weekend, we saw mm -hmm. what the state can do when it decides to deploy its violence. I mean, yeah. there was I mean, so many people were beaten up. Some of them have not talked about it, but I know a number of MGC youths in Mulawai were actually had their houses broken into, you know, mm -hmm. assaulted, adapted, and some of these guys are so afraid to report. But there is yeah, one yeah. young guy, uh, Tawanda Muchemwa, um, yeah, who, yeah. who, who is adapted, who is beaten up. And what is what I find quite funny about this story, if I may use the word, is that, I mean, it, it, the lawyers go to court and demand that the boys be released because it's, it's gone for two days without being seen. And the state releases him and the boy yeah. is beaten up. Yeah. So in this case, who is then, who, uh, do we, are we likely to see someone being taken to task? So then the state has to produce the person who beat up that boy. Well, I don't think we're going to see any accountability from the state because I saw the images on Twitter and on Facebook as well. It, it was very depressing to see because it was badly assaulted. But I think this is a state with a very well-documented uh, history of violence. Um, if you go back to 1980, where we started uh, with the killings in Gukurahundi, uh, the world, there is a lot of evidence to that effect. There are shallow graves in Matebele land. But even in light of that, um, insurmountable evidence, the state has not still been held accountable. They deny any accountability. If you go to 2018, soon after the 2018 election, um, a lot of uh, military personnel were shown on video shooting at citizens, uh, killing unarmed civilians that were actually running away. It's on video evidence, but during the commission of inquiry, military leaders, they denied this violence. So coming back to the issue of Tawanda, I don't think the state will take in accountability because there is plausible deniability in this case. They are likely to shy away from taking any responsibility. And this is something that we continue to see time and time again, even when there's evidence. And I think now there's the cover that they don't have evidence. Uh, as regrettable as it is, I think I saw someone on Twitter saying that um, Tawanda is very lucky that he's been returned. So you can imagine what that means, that as badly as he's had, a lot worse could have happened to him. There are many people that have been that have fallen victim to the state who are still unaccounted for. Even up to now, we can talk of Itai Zamara. So I'll be very surprised if the state takes any responsibility to this because they'll just deny, um, they have not even addressed the issue now. So the one encouraging thing, however, is that people have expressed their anger. Um, and it's also encouraging that the international community has also caught on to what has been happening in Zimbabwe. But as far as the state is concerned, I don't see them uh, taking responsibility. And then, um, if you consider the fact that of all the instances historically that ZANU-PF has been cornered, 
or of all the times that they faced significant political pressure, either as a result of economic uh, meltdown or other political pressures, the state has always resorted to violence. In 1980, they lost the elections significantly in Matabeleland. They were very violent. In 2000, 2000, 2007 and 2008, they lost the popular vote to Morgan Shangrai with a very violent uh, election rerun. Two years after our election now, the economy is not performing any better. Livelihoods have been ruined. There's a pandemic raging on. Our nurses are on strike. Salaries cannot buy anything. And there's a real pressure on the state. And just three days ago, there was supposed to be a protest in the streets. And of course, the state um, suppressed that um, response from the state of being violent all the time. I think it highlights the nature of the post-colonial state that we're dealing with. And it's one that does not take accountability for anything. If you listened to the president's remarks this morning, you would have thought that you would have um, addressed uh, the key issues that the country is confronting, be it the runaway inflation, the staging cases of coronavirus, but nothing. Instead, what you get is threats, uh, threat after threat of political activists and other actors. So it's highly unlikely that the state will take any accountability. Uh, you know, there's um, the shepherd here says Zimbabwe's liberation movements were not cleansed after the war and genocide. The trauma will still haunt if they will haunt even uh, the leaders who are still uh, in the war mood. Kukurundi too, no cleansing uh, of ZANPF said. So, you know, it's, 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 he says something very important when he, he says, you know, even the, these leaders, they, they, all what they know, there is violence. But be, going back to Tawanda's issue, there's something interesting. Tawanda is, is, is taken mostly from a, likely from a, 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 a around when he's arrested and with his friends, then he's the only one who disappears. You know, and the state, I mean, the likes of uh, Nick Mangwana, George Charamba, who have always said people, uh, you know, uh, kidnap themselves are quiet. They don't say anything and they have not said anything. But how different is this case from the case of Joanna Mamombe and the, and the other ladies who were actually adopted and their car was found in the police uh, station. But they were, and even if uh, after the police spokesperson had actually admitted that they had arrested them. But the state goes on a U-turn and they say, no, we never kidnapped them. We have taken their cell phones. They were moving around town, seeing boyfriends. So why are they quiet this time around when it's the same modus operandi that was used in the Joanna Momoke case? Yeah, you bring up a very important point. And I think it goes back, partly I think it goes back to the issue of accountability. Uh, and going back to the issue of Joanna Momombe and the other two ladies that were abducted, were allegedly abducted. Um, so a day after that they were abducted, there was a report that the police had them in custody. A day later, they didn't have them and they were gone. And you see some common threads uh, between that case and the, the more recent case of Tawanda. And I think what it highlights, at least for me, is that we are dealing with a very unpredictable state that is not hesitant to use violence. And despite the fact that there's a lot of evidence which implies that the state is directly implicated, there's been no accountability. And the one thing that I'm always fascinated by is the fact that no private citizen has the capacity to, to enact this kind of an operation. What kind of incentive would any private citizen have in abducting Tawanda or in abducting Joanna Mamombe? There's no rationale for it. So I think sometimes it's, benefic it's, it's productive to look at who benefits from these abductions. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Tawanda was abducted um, soon after this uncle, Ndudu Simatutu, had done an expose on the corruption that you see with the state. So I think this is an attempt to silence, to intimidate. Um, and then going back to the point made by uh, um, a listener on Facebook recently about the trauma of the violence, um, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the trauma of the liberation struggle uh, of the trauma of Gukura Hund and how that impacts the state now. But I also think that ZANU-PF by itself has always been very violent and there's no interest to reform. And why would they reform? Because the system as it is now, it's serving their interests. So um, 
I don't think there are many uh, incentives really for them to reform because this is a tactic that has worked well for them before elections, during elections, and to silence people. Um, so in that regard, I don't see any attempt to reform. So the idea of them cleansing themselves to me, although it might be necessary, I don't see them doing it because these are people that are set in their ways. They, don't in, they are not interested in reforming at all. So we are likely to see more violence from the state as things deteriorate further. You know, there, there is something that I, I find uh, interesting. In 1983, you know, during at the peak of the so-called dissidents, you know, the, the president says, cut the head of the snake. Emerson mm -hmm. uh, Nangagwa says, we had the problem of cockroaches and we decided to bring in DDT. And yeah. yesterday, uh, he, he, he comes out very angry. He talks about dark forces and he says that we are going to flush out, you know, opposition terrorists. You know, the language of always, and then you are already labeling someone terrorists. You know, you're always saying, you know, we, 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 they are dark forces internally and externally. So we yeah. are seeing that language that came before to say we have a problem of, of, of dissidents and we are not going to wait and watch while these people try and destroy. So now we are talking about dark forces that are sabotaging the economy. Is this a precursor to another, you know, can I say, you know, another genocide in a way or another, you know, use of violence to try and maintain the system? Um, so I think we are likely to see more violence from the state, particularly if you look at how the state has been operating and talking in recent days. So in many instances outside of Zimbabwe, wherever the state has unleashed violence on its citizens, this is the kind of language that you see. If you go back to Nazi Germany, the Germans were using this kind of language before the extermination of the Jews. If you go to Rwanda, the Hutu and the Tutsi violence was also underlined by these kinds of languages of eliminating the cockroaches. Even locally, Gukurahundi, they're also deploying the same language. So I think the moment you brand, you brand someone an enemy, a terrorist, I think it serves as justification for any form of violence that should then go on to unleash on them. And I think in this case, given the state of affairs in Zimbabwe, we're likely to see um, more violence. All right, so what, 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 what options do we have as citizens? Well, I've been particularly encouraged by the fact that citizens for the most part have remained nonviolent. Um, and I think nonviolence as a principle is particularly useful because it exposes the state and its extremities as well. Um, outside of those avenues, I don't see many avenues that can be pursued successfully as you have seen that despite the human rights abuses in Zimbabwe, we have not had anything significant from SADC uh, we have not heard anything from the AU chair. Other external um, institutions such as the UN have been vocal, but besides being vocal, there's really nothing much that they can lend to citizens uh, in terms of support. So I think at best we as the citizens in Zimbabwe and outside of Zimbabwe is to continue to raise awareness to these issues and continue to insist on reforms because there's no way we are going to outsource this struggle for a better Zimbabwe. It's everyone's fight. And I think everyone's need to make their voice heard to the outside world. And also hopefully that the ruling party pays an ear to the grievances of aggrieved Zimbabweans. You know, the, the other thing that people, I mean, if you look at Gukura Wundi, if you look at other people have said, probably the, the, the international community did not come on board uh, there. We have seen in the last two days, I mean, the hashtag Zimbabweans lives matter, you know, going all over the world and never actually every, everyone talking about it. Do you think these leaders care about these hashtags? Uh, I'm not entirely sure if they care because they are also confronting their own issues. The entire world now is confronting uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, but I do think that at some level, there is, they do care about these issues. Um, of course, you can make a case for why they don't care. But I think there are some countries that are quite invested in human rights uh, and allowing freedoms to be respected the world over. And I think countries, particularly in the EU, have been quite insistent on the need for re-engagement, but making sure that any form of re-engagement with Zimbabwe has to be tied to a better human rights record. Um, but apart from just 
apart from the sanctions and other pressures that they apply to Zimbabwe, it's hard to see how they can better um, campaign for the rights of Zimbabweans to be respected. Because for as long as the government in, in Harare is adamant that they don't want to reform, nothing much can be done to force them to reform. Uh, mind you, Robert Mugabe was in power for close to two decades, even when there were sanctions, even when most of his cabinet could not travel, right? So it's very hard to think of any measures that can be implemented to force the government to change. I think if there is anything that could force this government to change is the internal pressure from the citizens uh, trying know, to negotiate with the state to reform. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's someone who's talking about the international and regional pressure. This is what we're talking about. And we have always asked ourselves and then say, mm -hmm. you know, it's countries like South Africa and Botswana are the ones who actually feel the pressure when Zimbabweans actually, you know, run away for economic reasons or political reasons yep, to yep. South Africa. And largely, uh, maybe there's pressure behind closed doors, but these countries have not wanted to come, actually come out and say to Zimbabwe, you guys put your house in order. And probably they thought post Mugabe there was going to be some uh, something better, but we, we are going back to 2000 with this current government. And do you mm -hmm. think the regional leaders are going to come out and, and speak strongly against what is happening in Zimbabwe? Uh, so unfortunately, I, I do not have a lot of faith in regional leaders because the issue of Zimbabwe regionally has been a pertinent issue for quite some time now. Uh, going back to the days of Robert Mugabe, the region has been preoccupied with the issue of Zimbabwe. Morgan Changrai did uh, a charm offensive on the regional leaders trying to raise awareness about the human rights abuses in Zimbabwe, but that, that process did not yield much results as well. So I struggle a lot with the idea that somehow regional leaders will come to our aid. And if you look at the human rights record within the region itself, it's not very encouraging. Look what is happening in Tanzania. Look at, what is, look at what's happening in Uganda with uh, Kaguta Museveni. So I think when you look at the region, it's very hard. Of course, South Africa and Botswana, they face um, significant challenges, both most Zimbabweans end up flocking there. But South Africa has not been on the forefront of this issue. Uh, going back to Tabo Mbeki, I say that Zimbabwe does not have a crisis. He endorsed an election that was later on reversed in Malawi just recently. So I think regionally we also suffer from a deficit of strong institutions as well. There is no capacity to intervene in such instances. Of course, they will issue statements. Of course, they will do a, a, a few things here and there. But apart from that, it's very hard to see the region applying any form of sustained pressure to force any form of reform on the Zimbabwean government. And it's important to also acknowledge that most of these regional counterparts, they are also complicit in the violence of their own citizens. Right? So they don't have any moral high ground to speak on our issues. And I think South Africa might be the exception and a little bit of Botswana, but for the most part, they have remained quiet about these issues. Um, I don't know why, but I think for the most part, SADAC is not very useful when it comes to coming to the aid of citizens. Yeah, lastly, I mean, you, we, we, we seem to have talked about, you know, so much problems and I'm asking myself that as I leave uh -huh. this problem, I, I meet someone in the streets who says to me, so what's the solution? <laughs> well, I mean, we have any hope because uh, it's been 40 years of trouble and we are likely to have, I mean, the kind of government that we have now, these are the kind of people who are going to change the constitution so that they go beyond the, the two terms. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, they're not as young mm -hmm. as Robert took over mm -hmm. power. But these are the comrades who, who actually say, you know, the people have said we get another third term. So mm -hmm. what's, what, I mean, what's the solution? Where do we go as Zimbabweans? What can we do to get out of this mess? Well, I think the one thing that I find very troubling about the Zimbabwean political climate is that there are a lot of people uh, that are very invested in a better Zimbabwe, regardless of political affiliation. And I respect those people. But I think there's a group of people that do not seem to believe that they are affected by the political climate in Zimbabwe. They draw false equivalences. They would rather stay out of it. And I think for as long as citizens think that this is not their fight, we will remain in this predicament. And I think people need to speak up a lot more. Uh, people need to be involved a lot more politically, particularly the younger generation. People who were born as recently as 2000 are now 18 this year, are now over 18 this year, which means they can now vote. 
And I think there's need to educate people on the value of voting. Of course, there are issues of voter rigging, there are issues of voter manipulation, but I think if we vote in enough numbers, we can vote for the kind of leadership that we want. And I think regions such as Bulawayo, Harare, and other urban centers have the capacity to vote for leaders that can take the country to the next level. And I think also people need to be very active, not only on Twitter or on social media, but actually getting into the streets and exercising their democratic rights to protest. And I think for as long as people do not see the value in that, the state will always um, continue to do this kind of thing, unless it's compelled by people to reform. So I think people need to be more vocal, they need to be more engaged, and more importantly, they need to be involved in the political process. It's never too young to engage in these things. Uh, very young people such as Namatai, Macomborero, and other people are very politically engaged. And I think we need to keep doing more of that. And hopefully the state is more receptive of people's demands for reforms. Um, yeah, sorry for, for that uh, hitch there. There was a, a bit of an internet program, but um, well, let me fine. thank you for taking your time. I mean, I woke you up at 2 a.m. Uh, to come in. <laughs> so I never actually went to bed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, uh, let me at this point in time wish you, a, 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 I'm not sure that it's not a good night or a good morning, but. Uh, well, it's now uh, morning, it's yeah, 2 let, 7 in the morning. Yeah, let me thank you very much for taking your time to, to discuss with us this very important issue of uh, the, the violence in the pre-colonial, post-colonial Zimbabwe, because Zimbabwe has never had peace. Unfortunately for some of us, we have really never had peace. We moved from mm. Kukura Wundi to Esap to, you know, 2000, and now we are continuing. So from the moment we were kids, now we are adults. We were still struggling and battling with violence in Zimbabwe, and we have never known peace. We have always been afraid of a police officer. We have always been afraid of a soldier. We have always been afraid of someone who's called the Zanubi of Youth because they can make you disappear. So we, we are, all our lives we have been hiding. And this is why sometimes I tell people that, you know what? I think we have, we, we have just had enough. We have survived so many times under mm. fear that I'll be kidnapped, I'll be you know, killed. And I, I, I really don't understand even those people who keep this government in power and, and, and they're, they're actually the, 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 the touts of violence. What is it that mm. they get? Because we still go in the same shops. We are still going to, to buy the bread at the same price. And probably mm. your phone does not have data as mine. Mm -hmm. But no, you have the, the, I mean, the, the, I mean, the people who are beating uh, and adapting people, um, they, they are not all. They're not people who went to war. These are people who were born in the eighties. These are the people who are actually, you know, born out of India, I mean, after independence. And these are the people mm -hmm. probably who are, are suffering as I am and they go home and they find that there's no electricity, but they still have the, 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 the guts to go and kidnap someone. So we, we really, we are a troubled nation. We, yeah. we really need to sit down and, I mean, it's youths from across the political divide and ask ourselves, what is it that we want? Can we see a better Zimbabwe in our lifetime? And I think we can all coexist despite our political differences, but we have one thing in common, and that one thing is Zimbabwe. So thank you very much. And today in our program, we're talking to Abraham Sender, who is a PhD candidate in African history at the University of Minnesota. And, you know, it, it really pains me a lot that, uh, 40, almost 40 years after independence, we are still talking about violence. The same things that were done by mm -hmm. Ian Smith are done by our people. You know, yep. I mean, I, I understand why a soldier wanted to be, a, I mean, a Zimbabwean soldier or a black person wanted to be a soldier in the African drive session or in the Smith government, because they were promised their house. You always see adverts where they were advertising and say, come and join us. We're going to give you a house. You're going to get mm -hmm. a better life. You're going to get a car. But what are you getting in this regime? You know, we are you're just like me. You have nothing. Yep. You know, you are also suffering like me. But you are actually killing a brother to maintain a status quo, to keep someone in power. I think wherever you are, whether you are Zenzele or you are whoever, at one point we need to sit down and say, but why are we so much, you know, uh, suffering? Why are we troubling each other? 
You know, why can't we just have a Zimbabwe where we can exist and enjoy all of us with our different political uh, differences? And, you know, I can be ZANU-PF and enjoy, I can be uh, MDC and enjoy, I can be ZAPO, I can whoever that I want. But the bottom line is, we are all Zimbabweans and we should not be doing what we are seeing here. And unfortunately, this is not going to end. And we, we have not really started to build the pillars for a better Zimbabwe, where we have diversity, where we can argue and sleep home peacefully without actually you know, running away because I've argued with someone and they're going to come at night and, and, and adapt me. So it's, it's actually a sad situation that we have. And uh, I hope and pray that one day we are going to have the Zimbabwe that we, we, our parents fought for. You know, my name is Zenzel Ndebele, and uh, till we meet again in other programs, have a good day.